last time we talked to you, it was all about conscious evolution. Now you're doing a lot of thinking around social systems and economies and geopolitics, it seems. I heard a great interview <laughs> with you and Ken Wilbur, and uh, it made me think a lot about Simpol, a lot about uh, lower right quadrant experiments, and uh, just generally want to feel out what you're seeing in that zone, but also what projects you're working on in general. The short answer is not seeing enough in the lower right quadrant. I feel that, and this kind of came out in Ken's answer, like obviously as a reaction to a couple of centuries of ignoring the left side of the of the four quadrants, the, the kind of kickback and reaction in a totally you know, natural developmental way has been to emphasize the, the left side of the quadrants and say, you know, there's this important spiritual component to all this stuff and, you know, we need to pay more attention to that. And I think in general, as a culture, I think we're doing that a little bit more and more. So I think as a result of, you know, a reaction to, to, to ignoring the left-hand quadrants, Integral has in some circles become excessively focused maybe on the, on the upper, upper left in particular. And so it's simple, yeah, we think of ourselves as a lower right political project, but we don't see that many other lower right quadrants, or at least the ones that we do see are sort of small and fledgling and I mean, including us, right? So, we're, you know, we're still not having the impact that we'd like to have. Um, and I suppose that's obviously because, you know, until there's enough people at integral stages of development in the left-hand side, then these projects don't make sense to them. I mean, this is a problem that we have with Simpol is that we take the idea to a lot of people and few people really connect and engage with it. And they're like, wow. And it seems so obvious to them that it's needed. And other people are kind of like, well, I don't really, you know, it doesn't speak to them because they're not coming from a truly sort of world centric point of view, or they don't have perhaps the cognitive complexity to grasp the need for it you know, for global cooperation to resolve a problem like climate change. So I worked for ages as a teacher, uh, not a teacher exactly, more like a facilitator in schools. And I would teach children about climate change using this kind of systemic game theoretical lens. I actually designed a climate change game to uh, basically put groups of children in the, in the position of companies making these difficult decisions between individual and collective interest. And it's great because it gets them out of finger pointing and it gets them towards realizing more systemic insights. Even like a 10 year old at the end of the game will say something like, wow, we really needed better information if we were to tackle this problem to you know, <laughs> solve, the, solve the issue. Or, or wow, we really needed to like cooperate together as a whole group, not in our little groups. And it's like, so you get these really profound insights just because they played the game. And I did this at the, the Natural History Museum once with a load of environmental educators. So I assumed that people teaching climate change would have this kind of knowledge. They'd know, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a game theoretical problem. It's a tragedy of the commons. We need to cooperate in order to solve climate change. And the discussion made it really clear that, that even environmental educators, most of them hadn't really thought about the problem in those terms. They were still stuck in kind of bad companies, bad governments that need to, you know, pull their finger out. And if only the good guys were in charge, then we wouldn't have this problem, you know. So... That is another area where I think we need to see a lot more um, integral projects in the education sector. So I've currently, uh, I, that climate change game, I'm linking up with a woman who designed the UN learning website and trying to, um, she, she wants to get that climate change game into every single school in the world. And I'm also linked up with some people called Global ESD, which is, um, they're a kind of, uh, I don't know if they call themselves integral, but they 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 are they they came out of David Sloan Wilson's work with Pro Social, um, which is another area I'd like to cover just to signpost. And they have designed basically kind of educational curriculum tools, which are essentially lower right and integral in their thinking, I introducing a lot of evolutionary thinking, um, a lot of evolutionary psychology, a lot of theory about cultural evolution, which is all totally absent basically from school curriculums. Um, so they're doing some interesting integral education projects as well. So there's a few things emerging, but definitely need to see more. Uh, there's an interesting cluster of questions I have around that. And I'm going to, I guess I'm going to refer back to your interview with Wilbur because I, it's like I heard something in there that made me very curious uh, in a number of ways. And one was, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical about the idea that we have been overbalanced toward the lower right systems and been leaving out the left hand. 
Now, obviously, modernity didn't do a great job of officially integrating the left-hand zones, but everybody was still having left-hand zone experiences all that time. And the lower right zone, we didn't even really see very clearly. Yes, they had a system of the world, but they didn't conceive of it as a system necessarily in the way that the emerging pluralistic consciousness did. So it's been not very long that we've been able to think in terms of systems and in terms of networks and in terms of game theoretic processes. That's very new. And it's an area where I often think that's the least known zone because people have the fewest observations of it, right? Like everybody at every level or stage of civilization, they observe their internal responses. They have these relationships with people and moods and they see things, but almost nobody in any system at any level gets to take an overview of how the system's operating and see how that actually plays out over a long period of time. So it's an area in which we have a real deficit of impressions. So I'm, mm. I'm, I'm not totally sure he's right about that, but I, I, though I see the point he's trying to make. So that's one of my curiosities. Another part is, can we afford to wait for enough people to get up to the level of consciousness at which it becomes obvious to them that they need these new systems? Or do we need to somehow implement these systems that are smarter than the people so that the systems that are more intelligent, higher altitude systems can get better results and help the people get up to that level? Hmm. Okay, so uh, the first one first. Yeah, I have to say I, I, I had a sort of similar surprise when I heard Ken Wilber's point. I mean, to me, the Enlightenment was really upper right more than anything. You know, it was it was like for the first time, like, wow, we can break things into their parts and study them and see cause and effect and do experiments, etc. But for example, I mean, like, you know, the Club of Rome in 1972, that was the systems, that was a lower right project, right? And so the entire kind of like environmental policy has, has sort of come, emerged out of that since then. So I think like it might just be that policy and kind of, um, you know, in academia, we've been very focused on the lower right since at least the 70s, I would say. Um, and, you know, and this cybernetics was the new kind of field, right? So I think like, you know, certainly in academic circles and intellectual circles, people have been thinking about the world in terms of lower right. Maybe not for 200 years, maybe then more upper right. And But I think nonetheless, the point is that Yes, of course, people have still been having spiritual experiences. People have still been um, having upper right, where you can't do anything, but have upper left, you know, individual interior experiences. But I think certainly in our culture, there has been a kind of, I mean, also maybe different in the UK and the US, right? Because, you know, the, the, the UK is a much more secular culture. But certainly, like, when I grew up, it was sort of subtly implied that basically all that spiritual stuff wasn't really real. You know, I mean, I became an atheist until the age of 21, really. Without having had a massive spiritual awakening, I probably would still be an atheist. So I think, like, there's no doubt that it's been kind of sidelined or marginalised in our culture, those experiences. Again, changing now a lot um, because people are talking about it. People are having these kinds of conversations. Um, but wouldn't, I mean, I'll throw that back to you before answering the second one. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree to a certain extent we've, we've sort of marginalized or sort of covered over the upper left? Oh, sure, to some degree, and in, differently in different cultures. I think it hasn't had uh, official support in modernist regimes. Uh, however, it has been going on, whether it's spiritual practices or spiritual traditions or drug experiences or all that kind of stuff still been there. It's been tolerated. There's been a lot of interest in the individual psyche in modernity. All of the modern forms of arts and literature involve people psychologically introspecting, right? So I think, um, you know, just the emergence of psychology itself is, a, and the idea of the individual voter, individual liberty, the individual reasoner, I mean, Descartes is not necessarily thought of as a spiritual character, although he was in some respects, but he's certainly thought of as being a person who worked with subjectivity, right? So I think that even from the very beginning, modernity has a, has a pretty good mixture of these things. Like it's very focused on objects. Like Ken was saying, it has a strong sense of the system of the cosmos, but also those people were working with their subjectivity, working with their reasoning, introspecting, and they had a great peer-to-peer -peer relationship. There was a shared 
modern field. And in fact, sometimes we say modernity overemphasizes individualism, but that's a, that's a communal sense held in modernity that individualism is important. So I see yeah, it, you know, yeah. the fact that it came online so strongly and now dominates the world pretty much with its institutions means that it must have had pretty good balance in all those zones. And I, I, I mean, it's certainly, sorry, yeah, no, it's, I mean, obviously those zones have still been happening, right? Nothing else can, nothing could possibly stop that. It's just that I think a lot of the experiences that's taken place within them has been explained or, or accounted for by the right-hand side of the quadrant, right? So of course, yeah. people have still been taking drugs, still been taking spiritual experiences. But, you know, if you ask a Sam Harris and say, what does that mean? He says, oh, it's just brain chemistry. It's just ephemeral, like, you know, the, the confabulator in brain chemistry, you know? So it's just like in, in academic circles, officially the line is that all these things can be reduced to the right-hand side. And I think that's what people are trying to redress, right? Yeah, and I think Ken made a good point about that relative to quantification, right? Like modernity came up with a system of thinking that is like detailed, functional oriented, double checking, whether it's reasoning or doing science. And the easiest places to do those are places where you have numbers for things. The easiest numbers to get were about physical objects. In, in the degree to which they did get some numbers or quantity type thinking about interiors, then they went to work on interiors. It was just harder to get those numbers. So you got a lot of challenge to the ontology of subjective and spiritual experiences, even though people were still having them, people were still working in those zones. There were ways in which subjectivity was really honored, but the, the notion of the independent reality of that stuff was definitely challenged. Although that's it. in so far as modern people started to investigate those zones, they started to rethink that it just came more slowly. That's it. And I think, you know, like personally, you know, I used to conflate the word objective with real. Know, like I, I would just be like no no that's objective you know that's something that's actually happening out there as this subjective stuff is ah oh, well we don't know you know it's just it's just what I think it's not like a real thing you know and I think that's the precisely the error that's being corrected now hopefully yeah there was an official privileging of um, the external zones so remind uh, me of your second question the second question was I mean because now we're looking at what could lower right systems do at higher levels, not how did they manifest over the last 500 years? And can we get lower right systems that are at a higher altitude that match the kind of internal and group experiences that people are trying to have in the integral metamodern game B type universe? And if you could implement systems at that scale, can that in some sense bypass the individuals? Because we see areas where if you run a smart system, you can get results that seem to be smarter than the people who are involved. Just like if you run a dumb system, you can get collective results that are dumber than the people who are involved. So if it turns out that we maybe can't wait, even if it's 10 or 20 years only, to get people up to the mass level at which they see the need for these systems, if we can't wait, then we have to try to implement systems that are better than the people that get results out of the people more than we could expect from them and uh, sort of uh, urge them along to those higher levels at a much more rapid rate. Mm. It's really interesting because I, I asked this question to Hansi Reinacht and yeah. the, the response that I was basically saying, how can we create a kind of flattened version of simple that's going to appeal to people that yeah maybe don't have the levels of consciousness that correspond to it. And he said, don't. <laughs> He said, don't do it. And so I, I think there's two things in that single word. One is that it is kind of possible, you know, like, you know, to create flattened versions of metamodernism to, you know, scaffold people up to these ideas or to create systems where, yeah, I suppose, you know, by aligning interests is the kind of way that you do that, right? Uh, but, but, you know, there are also inherent risks in trying to, you know, kind of make individual, you know, and our, our conscious evolution go faster than, than it is, you know, and, and I don't know if this maps onto it, but I mean, for example, the push to institute postmodern values and norms resulted in a kind of Brexit slash Trump kickback, right? So I wonder if you might see something similar, you know, I mean, I mean, for example, like people's negative reaction to the EU, right? I mean, you've got a load of people in, in, in England who, you know, you go to communities like uh, Cardiff or Swansea, 
And, you know, you're driving past roundabouts with, say, with a big sign in it saying this has been built by the EU. I mean, it's like it's literally clearly they're getting funded, these areas, you know, and they need the funding. And you can see it. it's like, wow, there's this roundabout that wasn't there before. But there's this visceral kind of like Ugh, because, you know, it's perceived as interfering or something like that. So obviously, their you know, their national level consciousness is kind of going Ugh, rejecting it. Right. But I mean, that said, like for 50 years, the EU did a pretty good job, right, of scaffolding people up from nation centres into a more kind of global outlook. So I think it can definitely be done. And I think, you know, there's there's always this chicken and egg effect, right, is that, you know, you create the systems and then people start using them and that changes us, right? You know, you create a tool and then the tool changes the individual. So I think, like, there's always going to be this feedback loop where, you know, you can either work on individual consciousness or the system and they both interact with each other but I would agree with you that I don't think we have time to wait for it to happen organically. But here's, here's, I think, the leverage point. Because, you know, and Hansi talks about this in the listening society, people's cognitive complexity is not that. You can't leverage it that much. We kind, of, we kind of have a level that we're stuck with. And you can maybe get people to think in higher terms, but like only by, you know, difficult processes. What is definitely leverageable is people's values and social norms so this is actually comes back to a question that i asked david sloan wilson in the simple insights video i was basically asking how can we get people to a kind of you know global planet planetary consciousness where we start thinking about ourselves as member of the human race first and members of our nation second and how can we get people acting in the interest of the globe when there's no out group to spur the cohesion of the of the of the group of the planet as a whole you know so so larger cooperative groups have always been spurred by the arrival of an out group so two tribes fighting with one another okay a larger tribe arrives that's unfamiliar and suddenly these two small fighting tribes have a reason to cooperate and and, and, and fuse um, and so that happened all the way through history but obviously at the global level there is no out group so what's going to spur the development of a global you know united superorganism or whatever you want to call it and so I, and I floated the alien question, like, oh, what if aliens came? Would that work, you know? And he was like, basically, he was like, look, we, you underestimate the power of social norms, that social norms are actually the most powerful thing that, that affect human behavior. So, you know, if you, if you want people to stop flying, for example, they have that term in, in Sweden, like flugenschaft or something, which means like flight guilt. Um, I, I'm staying with my uh, girlfriend's parents and we, I, I've got them all recycling. Again, like not not through like, you know, but just like subtle, like, oh, look at me, here I am. I'm, I'm washing out the yogurt pot and I'm putting it in the thing, you know, and like people respond to that. They don't want to be the bad guy who's not doing the recycling or who's flying too much. If everyone else around them is a bit like, mm, don't do that, you know, and that's why your example is so powerful, right? That's why like if you, you know, go to a restaurant and you don't eat meat, that's much more powerful than wagging your finger at something because it just sets a kind of implicit social norm. I mean, I'm in Madrid at the moment and, and everybody eats meat all the time. Nobody recycles. Um, but every time I go out, I, I, I don't have to I don't have to sort of judge anyone or say anything bad. I just, you know, I don't order beef ever. And, and you know, people are like, oh, why don't you eat beef? And I'm like, oh, because of climate change, you know, pass the salt. You know, and, and like, it's, just, it's really subtle. It's coming from just me. But of course, at scale, then you get a whole load of vegetarians. So I think like social norms has a really important role there for scaffolding us up to kind of like more world centric behaviors um, before we have like properly world centric consciousness and the, the one will follow the other a bit. Yeah, I think that's right. And there's, uh, there's two sources of social norms. One is discussions that people have with each other. Uh, and the other one is behavioral protocols that they engage in for one reason or another. It might, they might, subjectively decide to engage in a different behavioral protocol like the recycling or they might be embedded in a, a local system that asks them to do something different like the way they vote or the way they drive or something like that there's tremendous potential to get results out of people that they aren't quite ready for and i think that goes along with development because very often i think nietzsche said this about the the church that the teaching of everyone is equal before God and God is the truth taught us to think about individual equality and truth, even though it was kind of like hyperbole or bullshit. Things start as bullshit and then they get deeper. The idea <laughs> that development involves a deepening means you have to start with something superficial. And so you can get people in on recycling and go, 
okay, we're doing it. We don't really appreciate it. But in five, 10 years down the road, after they've been doing it for a while, they might go, oh, I get it now. <laughs> this is why we're doing this. Often we, yeah. we learn our values after the activity has been performed for a while. So mm-hmm. if we can change the patterns of behavior, even if people aren't fully bought into it yet, we're setting them up for the possibility of assimilating that and moving to a higher level more quickly, I think. Yeah, totally. I mean, like a really good example is the smoking ban in the UK. You know, when I was 18, uh, funny enough, I could smoke till I was, when I was 16, it was legal for me to smoke and then they changed it to 18. I mean, around about that point when I became 18, they then banned smoking inside. Um, it's you, you can't smoke inside in the US either, right? Uh, well, I'm in Canada and uh, I'm not sure what the American rule is, but I remember when our cities changed and it was very, it was very frustrating to people for a little while. And then all of a sudden it was a lot nicer for everyone. And now it seems normal. <laughs> and I'm, I, I, you can almost pinpoint the decline in the percentage of smokers in the UK population from that moment onwards, you know, so that's an external law change, but consciousness followed, you know, suddenly like now it's just not that cool to smoke. You don't see people doing it in films. It's just, it's just not really thought of as cool. Like, I mean, even at uni, I had lots of friends that smoked, but towards the end, everyone was quitting and the people who weren't kind of felt a bit bad about it, you know? So, and, and that, that just wasn't the case 20 years before when everyone smoked inside. So um, it can definitely be done. So this, let's bring this back to simple because on the one hand, you were talking about setting an example. So setting an example at the international scale is some nation does it and the other nations go, oh, I see, that's doable. But then the simple premise is a bit like, well, that's probably not going to happen due to the uh, game theoretic dynamics of the way the market plays countries against each other. So you have to get some system whereby we create something like a collective instantiation of a new rule that would govern generally that would help us start to get up to the world that that rule represents. Mm. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think, um, but, you know, we shouldn't disregard the effect that that like, for example, Scandinavia has had on, on, on policy worldwide, you know, people do kind of look at the Scandinavian countries and go, well, you know, they're instituting this, that and the other. And like, you know, we, we, it certainly had an impact kind of modeling the right behavior, <clears throat> but we have to remember that they're unbelievably rich countries, you know, um, and also, <laughs> and also Norway it has, has vast reserves of gold, which, which came from their oil and still do, I think. So so it, it, what might be possible for Scandinavia, what probably won't be possible for most of the nations on Earth. And, you know, for a, a country like the US, for example, even though they've got the resources, they stand to lose the most from climate change because they do pollute so much. You know, so much of their industry is fossil fuel based. They have this like energy sovereignty thing with, with natural gas, all the rest of it. So, so I think that like, yeah, we shouldn't disregard the effect that like modeling the right behavior can have. But I think on that level, at that scale, with that many countries and that many invested vested interests, I think in the end, you're going to have to align individual and collective interest to get enough of us moving in the right direction quickly enough. I'm curious and skeptical about the mechanism by which this is implemented, because the bits of simple that I've seen sort of suggest that people pressure their elected officials to get on board. And I'm not sure how dynamic that is. Now, different countries are different, but looking at the American system, because it's so prominent in the world, it seems like there's very little response by their representatives from pressure by the people, right? That the American representatives almost never enact legislation that the majority of their constituents want, and they pay no real price for that. And even if they did, the two-party system is locked into this money-making agenda where they're not even particularly concerned about getting elected as long as the donations keep coming in. So within a system like that, you know, is it plausible to think you can get them on board by the people trying to pressure their representatives? Well, it certainly happened. Um, there have certainly constituencies in the UK where we've had a kind of domino effect, um, where it's a marginal seat. Nobody knows who's going to win. And yeah, like people signed up just because why not? And then the other guys signed up because they didn't want to lose out. So it certainly happened. I, I think it probably it would definitely works better in, in, in a political system where there's more than one viable party. You know, in the UK, we have, well, the Lib Dems is sort of uh, a distant third, but, you know, the Greens and well, are catching up big time. 
UKIP, of course, for a while were, were a sort of fifth political party, not so much anymore. <laughs> so I think it works much better when there's many multiple parties competing with each other. And in the US, I can see that it would be less successful. Just one point on that. I, I think that is a massive flaw of our democracy. And it's not it's not necessarily it's not it's not necessary or even good that a local MP or a local, you know, um, yeah, a local MP. What do you, I've forgotten what you call them in, in America, not an MP. They have like a, a mem Congress member of parliament. Senators down there. <laughs> Politician, whatever. Yeah. It's not necessary or even a good idea that they should directly follow the will of their constituencies, their constituents. Um, because you get, um, you know, the whole point of a politician is that they're supposed to deliberate and make decisions, um, you know, but they should obviously consult the public interest and then they have to make their own decision. I think Edmund Burke was an uh, English politician who basically said that. It's actually like he was making a speech. He said, it's actually not in your interest if I just follow everything that you tell me to do, because it is actually my job to sit in Parliament and deliberate and work out what the best course of action is. But there's a much healthier middle ground, because at the moment, MPs don't even know what their constituencies constituents are voting on on various issues so we i worked for something called whip for a while which was basically a kind of like we'd have like a referendum on everything being debated in parliament and you in your local constituency you could actually like vote yes or no on this particular issue and then the idea is we would just beam that information to the local mp and the local mp would see that information it would all be public like on a kind of um social platform so we could all see aha 67 percent of people in our constituent voted this way on this issue and our mp has voted the other way and so then the mp would have a little space where he could say here's why i decided to do this rather than go with your opinion da, 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 da. so just better information flows again it's just a systemic solution just create better information flows but yeah i mean there's no doubt that it's not that you know this is this is not um easy an easy process and it does need to move faster and I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know if voter pressure is enough to, to get us to where, we need to, to where we need to go quick enough. That said, it's amazing how, th how quickly things can change. Um, and of course, it's not the only reason why an MP might sign up. I mean, lots of MPs sign up just because they realise the need for it. Um, so I think all you need is, for example, one national leader of a party um, or one party to get elected who, um, you know, who makes a big noise about it globally and says, look, we all need to sign up to this. And suddenly you've got all sorts of different pressures, like, you know, forcing people to sign up. Um, I mean, in, in the UK, we have like a whip, a whip system. That's why we called it whip, where, you know, if you don't tow the party line, then you get warned. And if you don't tow the, tow the party line three or four times, you get expelled from the party. So, you know, there's plenty of other mechanisms whereby we could enforce MPs to sign up. It's just that now that's the most organic one we've got. And there, there, is, there is one, the really great thing about using voter pressure to pressure MPs to sign up is that it's really the bottom of the pyramid enforcing the decisions made at the top. So the whole danger with a kind of global government thing is, is obviously the abuse of power and corruption. But, but the, the way Symbol is structured, the top level decisions are being enforced by the voters, the people at the bottom. And that kind of structure is... Well, it's very um, holistic. It's very integrated. And I think it, it, it restrains abuse of power. So I think it's a nice way if it can work like that. But like, like you say, we're probably going to need other mechanisms. Yeah, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the ways in which mm, the systems of resource control in the world are inhibiting that process. Because that um, being informed from the bottom up at a global level it echoes the way we hope our nations are functioning, uh, but often our nations aren't functioning that way. And it's, it's one thing to say, of course, we don't want the, uh, the mass whim of the crowd to be determining the decisions of every representative in the legislature all the time. But in the absence of that pressure, they, they aren't neutral. They lean toward the ideology of their peers and the incentive structure of the market institutions that are dominant. And that's particularly obvious in the United States where they're very unresponsive to the collective will of the people and highly responsible to the moneyed interests that back them. Mm -hmm. And somehow that process would have to be checked at the global level as well, because we have these massive international highly funded and aggressive entities that will want to hack that process at every step. 
So is there a, does Simple have a, a notion of a kind of immune system? How is it going to protect itself from highly incentivized forces that wish to disrupt and hack those processes? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to say about that is the very reason why big financial interests are able to hack the current system is precisely because they are global and the national governments are national. So, so they can operate across borders. They can play countries off one another. Countries have to reduce environmental regulations. They have to cut taxes to attract big business. And so you get the situation where they're played off against one another. I mean, it's not a coincidence, for example, that the best tax avoidance cases, the, the closest we got to basically nailing Apple in the EU to actually pay the tax that they should pay um, was brought by the EU, you know, because Ireland had offered them very, very reduced rates. The EU said this is illegal. And there's this long court case, which very sadly, unfortunately, has just been thrown out. Um, but for a while, it looked like they were going to have to cough up. Now, it's not a surprise that was a supranational body that managed to do that. So I think like the only way we're going to restrain these, you know, powerful vested interests to operate at a global level um, whether it's big companies or um, consortiums or whatever it is, is by having some global level agreements um, that is decided by politicians and, and, that, and that people at the bottom of the period at least have a say in. Um, so we do have mechanisms where, you know, individual voters can have some kind of influence on, on what that policy is that's decided. But I mean, you know, of course, it's never going to be perfect. Um, you're always going to have some malign interests influencing the process. But I think we've got a way better shot at restraining those influences if we do have some mechanism for creating global level agreements that are implemented simultaneously. There's a, the dynamics of how those voting systems operate fascinates me. There's so many different ways to approach collective decision-making and voting processes. I was talking to Jim Rutt the other day about his notions of liquid democracy. Obviously, a lot of places in the world are deciding between majoritarian or plurality voting and ranked choice voting and things like that. It seems like if you could, like, what's the, on the one hand, what's the pre-SIM poll requirement? Like, what changes would have to be made in a society and in a culture in order to get them ready to align with a planetary body? And then on the other hand, how is the voting going to be structured at the planetary level? Because the particulars mm. of that cause a lot of downstream effects one way or the other. Mm. Well, I think like, I mean, to get individuals in nations, you know, kind of like on board with the decisions of a global level body. I mean, I think like everyone can see the need for more environmental regulation. You know, everyone can see the need to stop. I mean, tax avoidance, perhaps, is the is the is the easiest you know, the, the most consensus on that issue. Everybody's pissed off with Apple not paying enough tax. Everybody's pissed off with Amazon not paying enough tax. Google themselves, I'm, sh you know, I, I actually heard a conversation, you know, in between someone I know and the CEO of Google. And, uh, you know, I won't say who exactly, but essentially he brought this to him and said, look, you know, like you need to be paying more tax. Like this is going to be a massive problem. It's going to be a PR disaster for you. And the CEO of Google said, we'd like to, but we actually can't. We'll get sued by our shareholders. So I think like there's this serious collective will to get that problem solved. And any global level body that comes along with solutions to that is going to be quite popular. So I think people can see the need for that kind of thing if they have the mechanism to actually solve it. So I think like you will get buy in for something like that, as long as we can avoid the PR problem of like, uh oh, is this a big world government? I mean, that's the main that's the main point of feedback that you get is like, oh, it's really, really dangerous having global level you know, government, because people imagine some nefarious, like global level thing that's going to be infiltrated by the forces you describe. But I think Simple is fundamentally different from that. It's not a world government, it's global cooperation between existing governments um, and the means to enforce those agreements. So I think, yeah, but, that, but that, that's the PR thing that has to be handled is like, well, this is not a world government situation. And then the second question, sorry, what was the second question? What sorts of uh, voting procedures would operate at this planetary scale? Right. So that, to be honest, is we do have like a kind of working sort of framework of like how that could operate. There is a document on the Simple website which, alight, which alight, lays out exactly how that could work. Um, I think John himself would say that that's highly provisional and highly 
subject to debate and interpretation, and we need to have a much better conversation about how to do that. But I think our view is very much like we can worry about that later. Once we have enough politicians signed up, then we need to sit down and work out exactly how that voting system would work. Um, and, the, and to tell you the honest truth, I'm not 100% familiar with even our provisional attempt. Just one word on liquid democracy. I, it sounds really appealing. I really like the idea. I wrote about it in 2012, actually. But I don't know how it escapes that kind of, yeah, the problem with direct democracy in itself, which is that, like, you know, if you ask everybody if they want lower taxes, they're going to say yes. If you ask people if you want more government spending, they're going to say yes. If you ask people if they want, um, you know, to reduce the deficit, to reduce the debt, government debt, people are going to say yes. But you can't achieve all three of those things at once. And even in liquid democracy, you're going to have, because the decisions aren't being made by a single body, which is like essentially trading those things off against one another, you're still going to have that problem of like trying to have your cake and eat it all the time. But hey, you know, um, I think certainly better systems better systems are out there. I mean, there's some, somebody called Democracy OS in, in, in Argentina, which has been like introducing direct democracy systems. I think, you know, obviously the whole, the, the democracy as it works needs a fundamental update and it needs to be, it needs to be rooted in 21st century technology. Like fine, if we're not going to have direct democracy is one thing, but at least give MPs the information, at least give voters the information. You know, I mean, most, M most people in the UK don't know who their local MP is. And so it's hopeless. Like there's just not, the structures are not there to provide the right information flows. I think if you can get the information flowing well, so the MPs are accountable and, you know, constituents know what's going on, I think that would be a huge step in the right direction. Well, information flow is a huge problem, I think, going forward, because the, the ease with which people can put out misinformation and the public feeling that they can't trust information even when they encounter it is already enormous and is just going to get bigger. So there'd have to be an entire system of trying to make sure that people get information, that that information is valid. And, you know, right now it's hard to imagine people agreeing on who would say what information is valid. You know, particularly the United States is an egregious example. They seem to be 50-50 on reality all the time now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty frightening and makes it very hard to have any kind of conversation. Obviously, social media has, has, a, has played a huge part in fracturing the information ecology. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, I'm watching that whole situation just like everyone else is and going, shit. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't know how you start to address that. But, but social media needs to play a huge part in that for sure. I think that, this, you know, the slow erosion of trust in authority uh, really since the Iraq war in the UK, at least, was just like from that point onwards, we were like, wow, we were completely lied to in order to go to war so a load of rich people could make a load of money. Like it was so obvious what had happened. So I think, you know, trust, this is the old adage, is, is easy to break and takes a long time to build. Um, so there's no easy way out of that. And, you know, the saddest thing is when, you know, people start doubting scientists you know, who like, fine, might, might make mistakes like anyone else, like, but like just this total kind of easy dismissal of the scientific method and any kind of information that comes to me through my phone is suddenly given immediate credence because it confirms a whole load of like beliefs that I've had in the past. It's, 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 it's scary stuff. And I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any brilliant answers for what we do about that. I'm thinking about your comments about liquid democracy and, um, you know, obviously, direct democracy of any kind has to be stratified in some way. You know, I always, in the back of my head, when I was a kid, I had this idea where, sure, one person, one vote. But if you actually get informed, if you can, like, match up the candidates with their positions and things like that, then maybe your vote counts as five or ten votes. And maybe if you're a city official, your vote counts as 20 votes. And maybe if you're a representative, it counts as 100,000. And maybe if you're the leader of the country, it counts as a million votes. So you could have a system where there would be checks and balances, even though everybody could vote on every decision. But still, there's this problem of uh, what are the things to vote on, right? I think some of the European countries have citizen councils, which are an interesting thought, because we need to be, like you're saying, Everybody wants lower tax. Everybody wants everything and doesn't want to have to do anything. But is that the thing they get to make the decision on? Like, what is the legislative proposal at any step and where does that come from? Who's empowered 
nationally, but then also at the simple planetary scale, who's empowered to make a proposal and decide what the proposal is that everyone else is going to vote on? Mm. Yeah, well, in, in Switzerland, they have a kind of interesting system where basically if they have enough, basically enough people sign a petition, then the, the issue automatically becomes subject to a direct democratic vote. And people literally like meet up in town squares, like all over Switzerland and like hold up sticks. So, I mean, that's obviously quite kind of like uh, archaic. I mean, I don't know if it would work at scale within a big country, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't given this a huge amount of thought, to be honest, but, but these are important questions. Yeah, I suppose, uh, I suppose an app could be devised whereby people could collectively propose something. Uh, Estonia, but, is, Estonia is an interesting example of a democracy that's really made use of technology um, to provide much better information flows and give people much more say about what happens in a day-to-day -day basis. So, so yeah, I think, I think it's got to be digital for, for sure. But exactly how, you know, I, like, like I said, I've yet to see a kind of like, you know, liquid democracy format that I was like, yeah, this would totally be viable and totally be better than what we've got. Here's an interesting tweak to democracy, which I heard Vinay Gupta talk about. It's really interesting. So rather than have an election every four years where the entire, all the members of parliament are changed, have rolling elections. So have one every two weeks. So there's there each different constituency is voted on a different basis. So rather than have this dramatic transfer of power from one party to another, and then you get this discontinuity between their plans and our plans. You also get the incentive to like spend a bit more just before the election. Um, you get this short term thinking where it's like, all I need to do is get elected in four years time. That's my goal. So forget about climate change in 50 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And instead you have the house shifting on a rolling basis. Every couple of weeks, somebody gets, you know, some constituent is up and, you know, you, you, you the, 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 um, balance of political parties in the house just sh slowly shifts over time and it would encourage way more long-term thinking it would encourage way more cross-party collaboration and i think it would resolve a lot of those issues and um, i'm still definitely of the opinion that we do need representatives uh, whose job it is to sit down and work all this stuff out so i think maybe that that could be a really viable like update to our democracy that's a really interesting idea. One of the things I like about it is um, it behaviorally transforms the citizens into ongoing participants, right? Because right now, one of the things is if every four years I cast a vote and that's my entire political engagement other than mouthing off online about my opinions, then I'm not really a participant. And people will say, of course, you can't just focus on the elections. You have to be engaged in making the world a better place and political action all the rest of the time. But the rest of the time, it doesn't feel like the structure in which you're embedded is requiring it of you. So if it seemed like the society demanded that you regularly participate, you're very quickly going to become a different kind of a person, a person who's behaviorally and embodied as a political agent in that society on an ongoing and presumably progressively deepening basis. So I love that about it. Yeah, but I think, I mean, I think also the simple fact is that most people don't want to be thinking about politics all day long. Um, so I think this would work on a local basis, you know, it'd be like not one, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, so one state every, I don't know what we, it would be, yeah, like once every four weeks, let's say, one state every four weeks, they have an election. So it's like you, the only the people in that state would have to be really actively involved in that election. And then the next state, and then the next state, and then the next state. So it would gradually shift over time. Because I don't think everybody wants to be thinking about politics all day long. I, I mean, some people don't. Me I don't. You know, <laughs> but at the same time, I remember that pushback about the no smoking laws. Right. So part of it is I don't want to have to be on top of that. That's not my job to run the system all the time. But a lot of that reluctance is just an emotion that says I'm not habituated to perform regularly as a voting citizen. I'm habituated to maybe do it every few years. And so if I was behaviorally habituated to do it more often, I would probably have a great deal more ease in doing it. And it seems like it's going to be a big deal 
when I'm not doing it, but when I was actually doing it, it's like exercise. Oh, I don't want to have to exercise. But once you start, you're like, oh, this is actually pretty good. I like this. Yeah. I mean, in the UK, we've had so many like hot button referendums recently. So we had like the Scotland independence referendum shortly followed by Brexit and then a national election and then another national election, all in the space of like four or five years. Yeah. And people have got like, political fatigue (laughs) it's like uh, uh, like uh, like i don't know i mean people just got bored of like having to engage in these really contentious issues all the time and so i think that's a that's also a problem that we need to be aware of yeah it's a bit like not being able to trust your institutions or the incoming information you get this feeling of like i just can't care anymore about these seemingly huge polarizing issues that everybody's talking about the scotland thing seemed to be say outside of my control as well (laughs) Because Scotland, uh, like Quebec and Canada, and like the question of should the Kurds have a homeland, this kind of there's questions about whether um, self-identified blocks should be their own nations or not. And you, you know, there's some with some interesting back and forth in your interview with Wilbur on the nation state because it sounded like it was a topic he was still considering that he hadn't really concluded about the role of the nation state in a. Uh, a global holarchy of scales of governance. What do we keep from the nation state? What do we lose? Is it an essential organ in that stack or could we do without it? And, you know, there's just a really open question about the role of the nation state. And Mm. I don't think anybody's decided. And one of the ways that indecision shows up is every independence vote I see anywhere in the world is about 50-50 every time. It's like Scotland never really leaves and is never really staying. Same with Quebec and Canada. Same with the Basque region in Spain. You know, is it independent? Is it not independent? Can we decide? It seems like nobody can figure out how to manage the the concept of the nation state. Mm. What's your feeling there? Do you think it has an important role or do you think it's inherently problematic? I definitely think it's an important role. Um, You know, I think, at Simpol, we apply the principle of subsidiarity. So it's just like, could this this issue be tackled at the at the national level without any, um, you know, uh, sort of like uh, abuse of the collective interest? You know, so like basically, you, you push decisions down as low as they can possibly go. And there's certainly some things like I don't know, um, healthcare policy or education policy um, that could definitely be decided at at national levels. I don't know building motorways, you know, there's plenty of stuff that could definitely be decided at that level. I do think that, um, that a lot of the independence movements come from, I mean, they tend to be, a lot of the, these places tend to be slightly more to the left than the, than the national government that they're trying to get away from. Or it's certainly the case in Scotland. It's definitely the case in Catalonia. I think it's the case in Quebec, or am I getting that one wrong? Uh, it's hard to tell. They're more conservative in some ways and more progressive in other ways. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, think certainly in- actually, I think it's a combination of um, a deep sense of tradition combined with a slightly left-leaning political sensibility. Okay. Okay. Right. 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 Well, so but then it's the left-leaning political sensibility that I'm addressing because these are exactly the kind of sensibilities which are really offended by the system that we're living in where basically countries all have to go cap in hand to the big companies you know and 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 gradually erode all these kind of left-wing values like environmental protection and workers rights etc in order to attract big business so i think like in many ways like some of these movements might be placated in in a world where actually there's this global level integration where you know, people do feel like members of the human race first and members of their nation second. You know, I think like in Spain, like the national identity has this really fractured thing because of Franco and because of the civil war. And, you know, flying a Spanish flag is still kind of like, right, you know, it's like it's sort of a right wing thing. And I think like, you know, like, uh, like, I don't know where I'm going with this exactly, but I just think that these dynamics might change quite a lot in a world where you have an effective global decision-making body that's actually making decisions that in the interest of people, that people in Scotland might feel that, you know, their political views were being actually, actually represented better in that kind of system. Because that's where a lot of it comes from in Scotland. And I totally sympathise. They're basically like, dude, we could be like Scandinavia now. 
you know like we could have like an incredible education system we could be really progressive with like you know gender rights we could have like really good climate change policy we've got loads of forests loads of natural resources and like basically you know the uk which is like way more you know far more to the right than scotland is kind of like fucking all this up for us you know so i think like you know the uk for example would be much more in practice would be much more left wing in a system with something like simple in place because they'd be able to tackle the environment they'd be able to tackle you know tax avoidance and therefore they'd be able to spend more um so i think like that might address some of those like concerns but not all of course you know you know in catalonia for example um it's very hot button right now you know it's really tense they did they did successfully vote to leave it's just that it wasn't like an official referendum Right. Um, it was like a kind of rogue referendum. Um, I went to one of the protests actually just to kind of check it out, but like, yeah, it was, it was a lot of anger. I'm undecided. I feel like it's a question I've been wrestling with my whole life. And in the integral sense of the lower quadrants, you know, nation state suggests a bureaucratic geopolitical structure of a state versus a, a shared spirit of nationhood. And the countries that we have in the world right now, it's not clear that the nation state represents any nationalities. Like in the United States, for example, it seems like at least two nations are constantly at war for control of that state. And it may be that it's very hard to achieve developmental stability and cooperation in a country where there isn't a good balance between statehood and nationhood. And then the question would be, how do you get that balance? The only two options are you break up states to make them make the borders fit around nations better, which is what independence movements are, or give the curve the homeland movements are, or you try to cultivate a shared nationhood in an existing state, which I guess, you know, the Chinese are trying to do that. But the only ways that's ever worked historically have taken a long time period of time and often a lot of violence and top-down force. Mm. So it seems much more likely that you can break up states to more closely resemble nations than that you can rapidly build nationhood for existing states. Yeah. Well, but I mean, there could be a middle ground again, like where you just devolve a lot more powers, you know? So like devolve a lot more powers while at the same time having global level agreements. So it's like, you can still have some decisions being made at the national level. But I, but I think that the point you make about like identity and statehood being separate is really interesting because I think like, you know, part of the postmodern sort of critique has basically made us really wary of nation states and the power and the abuse of power and, and, and rightly so. And so I think like as people move to world centric consciousness, they get really skeptical of the nation state and, and, and really kind of, you know, and that has kind of eroded you know, for example, like that's why the, that's why the national flag ends up being a kind of right wing thing, you know, like a nationalist, like right wing thing. And then, you know, metropolitan elites in, in London are all kind of like really wary of like nationalism, you know. But so I think like as people's identities have moved, that's obviously like eroded the kind of cohesiveness at the national level. And then, you know, like people up north in England feel like people in London are not representing British interests, et cetera, et cetera. So I think like that also is that's kind of undermined. But I think maybe maybe you know look going forward if we can have more global level agreements that are actually backed up then maybe you know people will start to feel differently about their nation you know like metropolitan elites won't feel so kind of um, skeptical or dismissive of it but like they'll actually start to like recultivate and remember the nice bits about their kind of national tradition and stuff which kind of glues us all together i mean for example like i'm you know very very global in the way i think about things and the, the way i think about policy and everything but then again, I still like I watch football and then I go like crazy when England are playing football. So I think like you can totally hold the two at the same time. And I think that's like that kind of almost like conscious exorcism of like this like patriotic spirit. Like I'm, I know I'm doing it when I'm watching football. I'm like, yeah, I'm just exercising this muscle. It's fun to get really like angry at the TV when England do badly in cricket or whatever. But like there's a kind of ironic distance. I think like that's that's where, you know, where, where that works for me anyway. Yeah, I think you're right that, I mean, if you had a system that increased regional autonomy within countries, that would solve some of the problem of the independence if they could take over more control. Uh, there's a real uh, chicken and egg problem with 
international and national cultures. Because on the one hand, do you need a, a strong, healthy, coherent sense of national feeling in order to liberate enough energy and attention to accept a planetary scale system? Maybe, <laughs> but you probably need a, a good relationship with a functional, trustworthy planetary scale system in order to um, change your own nation to the point where it gets a nice nation spirit of some kind. So, I mean, mm. we say chicken and egg problem, but what we really mean is you've got to work on both of those simultaneously. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually that brings me to something that I've been wanting to um, talk about as well, because it addresses your first question about the need for lower right integral projects. Um, and this might have to be my last uh, answer as well, because I've, I've got to go. But uh, are you familiar with Pro Social by David Sloan Wilson? Yeah, so that that's based on just for people who aren't. It's based on the work of Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom, um, and basically she worked out eight core design principles that groups need to have in place in order to function effectively as a cohesive group. And she started off by looking at communities managing shared resources like shared fisheries and shared forests and stuff like that. And David Sloan Wilson came along and says, "No, no, this is you can actually apply this at any scale of evolution to any group, whether it's a company or a nation or even the whole world." And so, and I think, you know, their, their, their number one criteria, the first core design principle is shared identity and purpose. So I think you're absolutely right, is that like, if we're going to function as a, a cohesive planetary organism, we need to have a very, very strong shared identity as a human species. Like I'm human, I'm proud of being human, and all humanity wants this, whatever it is. I think it's evolution is what we all want. I think that's the best contender for shared identity and purpose at the global level. For the nation state to persevere and, and to, to, to function within that and do the role that I think it's going to be required to do, we're going to have to have a shared sense of identity and purpose at the national level too. And those two things can't, they, they don't have to be at loggerheads with one another, which is what they are now. You know, like, for example, if you work in a big organization, it's quite, e quite possible to have a very strong sense of shared identity in my team, but still have a shared identity with the purpose of the company as a whole. And so that's what we're looking for, not like a situation now where it feels like you have to choose. Um, what we're looking for is a healthy integration of these where I have identities at every single level and, you know, shared sense of purpose with all the other people at that level. Yeah, I think the Olympic Games, when done well, uh, give a lot of people that simultaneous experience of national pride and international participation. Mm, yeah. So I think there's uh, rituals that we can enact on the global stage that involve many nations that could give everybody both of those at the same time if they were handled correctly. Mm, yeah, that's absolutely true, isn't it? The Olympics is a really good example. And I think like, but I mean, there's no question that like the biggest deficit is in the global level identity. That's where the real work needs to take place. Um, and I, one of the most inspiring things I love telling is the story of Voyager 1, which is the, the, the satellite that we sent out into, into space. And on it was a golden record with like a kind of, basically like the resume of humanity, like on this record. It was in the 70s and it has like 150 different pictures, like including like the Great Wall of China and like a mother nursing her child or like the sea or like a family or even like pictures of the planets and like some of our mathematics. Like, you know, it's got, it's got the best of humanity's music that they kind of decided that reflects the whole planet. And it has this incredible message on it, which I think is from uh, President Carter, who was in, time, in, in power at the time. And it says like, we are trying to solve our problems so that we may live into yours. And we hope one day, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. And I love that. I think that's so inspiring because it simultaneously acknowledges we've got problems, but that we're going in the right direction. And that only when we've managed to solve our problems and work cohesively as a planet, will we be ready to join a community of galactic civilizations. And that's, that fractal structure is exactly what evolution has been doing all along. Um, and I think these kind of powerful stories that we're going to need to knit us together at the global level. Yeah, it makes, you know, you can really see Ken's point about needing a lot more people who feel that way, who uh, are viscerally inspired to operate at the planetary scale. Uh, and that's super important because there's a possibility that you can tell people a story 
and you can give them reasons why they're all interconnected and it won't go very deep that it'll constantly be sabotaged by the just the density and energy of their lower level identities and because people have to yes we can see a globe in school and be told that we're all on the same planet but Almost none of us have enough experience of other nations, of other cultures, of shared challenges and shared rewards to do the practical things that build up shared identity in a natural way, rather than just being told that you're in some group. Because I think a lot of the problems, a lot of the suspicion about global governance, is just that it's, we're kind of blank about it. Most people don't even see that level. It's just something they've heard about. It doesn't feel real. So that's a huge work to try to get more and more people to feel the reality of that. But if you could set up systems that worked, that we relied on at that scale, I think that feeling would come a lot more quickly. I know you got to go. I, I'd love to have a whole nother conversation with you about competition and cooperation. And maybe we'll do that next time. I'd love to do that. Yeah, very nice to speak to you, Layman, as always. Yeah, lovely to talk to you, Rob. Cheers. <laughs>